Uh, at the time of writing this view of Africa, there had been three reported inc incidences of piracy off the coast of Somalia. It's now risen to five. Uh, this burst of activity is prompting a lot of concern, a lot of questions, uh, particularly around is the counter piracy uh, uh, practice and operations still going to be successful? And whether this is going to actually prompt a return of piracy and armed robbery, uh, not only to the Horn of Africa, but to the wider Indian Ocean. The key message for my uh, presentation today is that holistic responses are needed for maritime security in Africa. Uh, piracy is just one of many threats. Uh, this requires us to frame and understand the piracy problem against a kind of a long-term and comprehensive backdrop. Uh, what is ultimately at stake is more than simply a, a potential resurgence of piracy, but ultimately the creation and um, development of African maritime development, such as the Blue Economy Initiative, which I'll be dealing with uh, or, or getting into a little later. Uh, this provides us with the first major question uh, to tackle today, is piracy really back? Uh, to do this means we'll look at the recent incidents and, uh, and tell us if that is uh, what we can glean from those to tell us if there's going to be a return to the menacing levels of the past. Um, what is of interest today are some of the paradoxes uh, which uh, have occurred in the analysis and will hopefully be uh, discussed later on as well. This also leads us to a second question. What sort of impact is it going to have on Africa's broader fight against maritime threats such as illegal fishing and human trafficking? So to start, let's first review the recent incidences and establish what we know for sure and what we can use and work with in the analysis. The first major incident occurred on the 13th of March. It was the ARIS-13, which was hijacked just off the coast of Somalia. It is the dot right on the Horn of Africa. Uh, an intervention from the Puntland Maritime Police Force uh, led to a gun battle with uh, the pirates on board. Uh, subsequently, the ship and the crew were released. Um, the fate of the pirates is not yet clear. Although the safe release of, like say, of the crew, albeit unfortunately traumatized, was the primary objective. Uh, what was encouraging was the news, according to the Sri Lankan government, that no ransom was paid to secure the release of the ship and the crew. The proximity of the ARIS uh, and the journey along the Somali coastline is makes it a particularly easy prey, unfortunately. It was sailing far too close and behaving in a way which made it far too vulnerable uh, for would-be pirates, far too tempting a target. Um, it should not have been there, and uh, as I say, uh, should have followed different practices. Um, without looking to blame the crew and, and, and the decisions, because uh, they can obviously be very easily overwhelmed by armed pirates, uh, it does appear that some companies uh, and shipping owners are pressuring crews and ships to sail far too close to the Somali shoreline. Within 12 nautical miles or even closer, this is often to shave off costs uh, to uh, create as uh, uh, cut down on fuel and time. Um, unfortunately for me, though, the cost savings don't justify the elevated risk, which is often then encountered by crews. This has been followed by four uh, hijackings. Uh, one of the hijacking of a Somali fishing boat, which was later found abandoned. It seems this was to be used as a, a mothership. Uh, the motherships are, are enable Somali pirates to go out for longer and further into the uh, into the ocean, and particularly be important in the coming months as the monsoon is going to create the kind of sea conditions where an easy boarding out on the high seas is is no longer very easy. Um, so therefore, to have that kind of ability to uh, attack a ship very quickly and 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 almost creep up on it is a is is a big boon for pirates. And interesting that this one was abandoned. Um, there was a, a, an Indian dhow which was captured near Socotra Island, which I think you can see in the presentation, is, uh, it, it juts out from the Horn of Africa, it's a, a Yemeni uh, territory. Um, the two members of this crew have, have been kidnapped, uh, the, the other nine have been released, and it's not quite clear where these two people are at the moment. Uh, a day later, a Pakistani vessel was, uh, was captured near the Yemeni coast. Um, and it's unclear, unfortunately, how many crew were captured and what has become of them at present. Uh, finally, uh, just a few days ago, a Tuvalu-flagged vessel known as the OS-35 was, was boarded by pirates south of Yemen. Uh, again, a considerable distance from, uh, from Somalia. Uh, it seems that a, a Chinese team then boarded the vessel, assisted by other navies such as uh, India and Pakistan, has been reported. 
uh, and found no pirates on board. Um, so a good, quick naval response there. So looking at these locations, we can see that uh, incidences don't really have the great geographic range they did in the past. Um, they, technically, interestingly, some of these have occurred within the territorial waters of Somalia and thereby by the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, not legally or technically acts of piracy, uh, something to try and explore a bit further on. Um, what it is demonstrating is there is a willingness and it seems an ability to launch missions further out to sea. But we need to work with what we do know for sure. And uh, the success rate of the pirates, if we judge it against a standard where they uh, secure a ransom and they're able to do it in a relatively unhindered way, is not been so good for the pirates so far. Um, it now depends on what our responses are going to be. It seems that ransoms haven't been paid. Uh, this means there's no guarantee for pirates of an easy or a quick reward or that the risk is suddenly low for uh, for hijacking. What is troubling, as I say, is that two crew have disappeared and another crew, uh, the total number and their whereabouts is uncertain. As the response from navies has been relatively robust and relatively quick as well, um, it's not enough to signal to pirates that they will be able to operate with a sense of impunity or that they'll have time to necessarily either uh, secure a vessel or to get back to uh, their havens. Um, crucial, as I say, is is the high seas. Uh, these attacks um, have been occurring close to shore as well as on the high seas, but the reduction in traffic in waters close to Somalia would mean that they would have to go further out onto the high seas, where they would be more, um, uh, so, should we say, uh, easily interdicted by naval forces. What we do need to pay attention to there as well is, is the kind of language we're using to frame these incidences. It can lead to a lot of ambiguity and, uh, and the response can be quite confused. For me, warnings of resurgence need to be accompanied by a, a, an important caveat. Um, it's too early to say there will be a risk of a return to piracy to the levels we saw before. That's uh, often implied to mean between 2008 and 2011. Uh, if we continue to adhere to good practices and best management practices at sea and maintain the kind of vigilance and, uh, and uh, utilize the infrastructure which is in place, we can stay one step ahead of the pirates. Um, this means that talk of a resurgence is a bit misguided. And if we talk of a return, it does seem to imply kind of a pass passivity or a vulnerability, which I don't think is actually there. Uh, it also, unfortunately, means that Africa remains a kind of a marginalized actor. When I say Africa, I mean all African states who are interested in fighting piracy, but Africa at the African Union level and organizational level as well. They seem to be relatively marginalized in the discussions, and that's something I'd like to return to a bit more uh, later on. Uh, while the safety of the crew is assured, as I say, the narrative of, uh, of no ships being hijacked is, is taken on water. It's, it's been punctured and uh, its future is now up for discussion. Um, but it, it does point out that the narrative and, and its assumptions were based on the security of merchant vessels. So the, the major incident which has started the uh, discussion of a return was the, uh, the ARIS-13, which was a merchant vessel, not, for instance, a local DAO or a fishing vessel, which there are many doing trade along the Somali coastline. Um, therefore, I believe it's far more critical to note that this was the first commercial vessel, but hijackings have occurred for the last couple of years still, which are acts of piracy, um, say especially local fishing vessels and DAOs. Um, stakeholders such as navies, international organizations, uh, private security companies and, and various government uh, departments have, have, have always warned of uh, a, a continual risk of being uh, a prey to pirates if they were to, if ships were not to follow best management practices and to uh, and to and to adopt behaviour which would put them at risk. Um, it seems that 11 incidences occurred in 2016, according to Oceans Beyond Piracy. That should alone point out the risk that sailing too close to Somalia or uh, dropping your guard is inadvisable. Um, it's also widely suspected that many incidences go unreported. And here I'd like to go through a couple of slides. Now, compared to the last one, this is from the International Maritime Organization, where you can plot recent incidences on a map. And the only two incidences they have are the ARIS and the recent OS35 attack. Now, 
Um, it shows how dependent we are upon victims reporting being uh, atta uh, attacked by pirates or escaping from pirates. But interestingly, this hasn't filtered through into the kind of main representations that we rely on to depict the threat, but also to try and understand it further. Um, from 2008 to 2011, uh, uh, hijackings were relatively common, uh, relatively easy, and counter piracy responses were being consolidated. Uh, the combined efforts nowadays have reduced the risk. Uh, guards on board ships are part of best management practices. The uh, new kind of sailing um, measures or, or routes taken. Uh, and importantly, the reaction of local Somali communities to uh, pirates in their midst or in their villages. Uh, there's been a rejection. There's been a chasing out. Um, there's been a kind of uh, a new kind of understanding that piracy is not good for uh, local communities. And that needs to be explored a lot more. It hasn't been explored so much in the past. We must still tackle a few misapprehensions. The ISS has long stressed that uh, the Diath of uh, reported incidences, and here I stress again, reported incidences, does, cannot be taken as an indicator that maritime security has returned to African waters, either off the Horn of Africa or further afield as well. Um, the, the Somali littoral has, uh, has has been has gone through stages where it's been perhaps you've been able to sail through without being attacked by pirates, but that was never a long term guarantee. And um, I'd like to point out here this is the 2015 map. Now the purple dot, according to the International Maritime Bureau, so it's different from the IMO I mentioned earlier. This is the IMB, means a suspicious incident. But in 2015, according to the Oceans Beyond Piracy Piracy Tracker, uh, 17 crew members of the Iranian flagged Siraj were kidnapped and uh, taken to Somalia. And this unfortunately does not figure on this uh, map and in a lot of the reports. Um, the crew were allegedly illegally fishing. Now, while this may be, like I say, uh, 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 this allegation may prove to be true. Uh, it doesn't justify their detention or any kind of the trauma that they've uh, suffered in their in, in their time. It's been over two years now since they've been um, moved around Somalia and uh, and held and held hostage. It does point though to a, a big concern, something we need to factor in when we talk about piracy in the future. Uh, the cases of illegal fishing, not only how that motivates or 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 seems in the eyes of many pirates to justify their actions, but. Uh, but, but also that it will risk, for instance, long-term food security. People are reliant on food from the sea. Populations are going to increase in the future. Now, how are we going to feed ourselves if we are relying on fish, which is no longer there? Um, simply put, the threat of piracy drove away many illegal fishing vessels from around the Horn of Africa. Uh, fishing stocks, therefore, not only recovered, but they thrived. Uh, the risk of being captured by pirates if you're a legal fishing uh, vessel who uh, as is often claimed by pirates, they're going out as a coast guard to prevent this, means that if you were captured, the risk of, of harm would be great. Um, the various counter-piracy policies and practices, especially international naval patrols, therefore deterred and drove away many of the pirates, um, reducing the risk of such an encounter. Uh, Somali vessels are often viewed with greater suspicion and hostility because um, they will resemble piracy vessels, whereas an illegal fishing vessel will often, if properly flagged or carrying permits, will not appear to be a pirate vessel and will therefore be not within the mandate of many of the patrols. This is in part allowed illegal fishing vessels to creep back in to these seemingly almost guarded fishing stock domains. Um, they've taken advantage of these abundant stocks, um, say they bear very little resemblance to a piracy vessel if properly flagged. And this grievance then that illegal fishing vessels have crept back in is a major justification or a major uh, motivation for people to look again at actions at sea, for instance, prevention of illegal fishing. But also if somebody says we can do something about this, we'll organize together to do something. They're much more um, vulnerable to that kind of um, manipulation sometimes, should we say as well. But it goes to show that the maritime security tools which we need to enhance in the fight against piracy also need to have a, a broader kind of, uh, they need to be able to tackle other crimes as well, uh, which particularly affect human security. Uh, these will go a long way to making more effective maritime security in the future, because uh, fishing, as I say, will not only provide food security, 
but uh, it needs to be there to feed growing populations in the future. It's a long-term interest. The key issue, therefore, is to ensure that problems are not narrowly addressed uh, and approached, and that the existing infrastructure where it can be is adapted and uh, expanded. The key issue is to ensure that problems, like say, uh, are there that the infrastructure can handle. Um, piracy is still in place, and the infrastructure to tackle piracy, despite being slightly diminished by the reduction of uh, NATO patrols, is still very uh, successful. It's been, like say, touted as a very successful kind of way of tackling piracy in the past. There's no reason to suspect that, or it's reasonable to uh, think that the deployment of those resources as they exist now can handle any kind of expansion of piracy in the future. Uh, South Africa has been uh, very active in conducting anti-piracy patrols with Mozambique and, and Tanzania in uh, the Mozambique Channel uh, for six years now as well. Uh, so there are also lessons to be learned from the example of the Djibouti Code of Conduct, which is a sub-regional agreement whereby 22 Indian Ocean states agree to share information and ultimately uh, build up to conducting things like joint patrols to fight piracy. Now, this has been expanded in recent months to include things like illegal fishing, very positive step, and also crimes which are encountered, such as illegal trafficking. This is anecdotal, but a lot of um, reports from anti-piracy patrols often note illegal fishing vessels or very suspicious vessels which might be involved in human trafficking or migration. But often those are, like I say, not within the mandate or there's another task to be pursued. So those are often left unaddressed or, or, or not investigated. Now, this now gives us the kind of teeth and the ability to do that. Um, of note, though, these revisions were first proposed in 2013, so they've taken quite a long time to be accepted and put into practice. Um, but I think it does now demonstrate a willingness on the part of the international community <coughs> and maritime security actors to... Uh, to take more of a stake and more of an interest in wider crimes than before. So the expansion is a, uh, in cooperation particularly is the most positive step um, and it, I think it will have clear results. It will result in better information sharing and hopefully more maritime domain awareness in the future. This also aligns with an African, uh, an African perspective that stresses how important it is that we look at piracy and illegal fishing as a broader security problem that hinders the creation of blue economies and protecting our oceans, as we can see in this photo here from the Lomé summit last year. Uh, this was a key point stressed there. Uh, Africa, led by the African Union and maritime states, regional economic communities as well, has begun seeking to enhance its common responses to maritime security threats and, uh, and implementing integrated maritime strategies. Uh, these include the 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy, or AIM 20, uh, AIMS 2050, uh, designed to overcome common problems by seeking out common solutions given the transnational nature of maritime crimes and also the limited capacity uh, to address uh, and overcome these challenges. The AU in particular though now needs to revive the implementation of this strategy, uh, coordinate a common African maritime position on piracy and, and various crimes and how to address those going forward provide guidance from member states on how they can empower the African Union, but also uh, take command of their own seas and, and build their own blue economies. And, uh, and, and looking from a central location about how to analyze the maritime security situation going forward, uh, uh, providing early warning, better awareness, and therefore better deployment of resources. To sum up then, uh, is piracy back? Uh, here's the paradox. It never really went away. It changed appearance and scope, but it won't return as before. It's uh, in the Mar East African maritime domain, piracy was and continues to be a risk. Uh, its lack of international victims meant that attention, though, was diminished. Uh, piracy itself remains present, obviously, in West African waters as well. And secondly, are we better able to cope with the return? Yes, but the tools and the infrastructure need to be redeveloped and the strategies and codes and conventions we have need to be implemented now. Um, this will improve cooperation. Uh, we also, therefore, need to be always thinking about uh, how we intend to take maritime security beyond piracy. And I think the idea and the concept of the blue economy is therefore a very useful anchor for all actions going forward.